almost a year now, we have been living here in Antarctica, lost and almost forgotten on the edge of a vast continent with solitude, cold, and the wide open spaces as our only companions. This period isn't an easy one to relate. How can I describe an experience located out of time, beyond words? How can I express everything that has changed within me since I started frequenting the Emperor Penguin, the sole inhabitant of the polar winter on a daily basis? How can I darken the purity of the white continent with words? How will I manage to describe everything I've seen? After six days at sea, we fly over the Adelie coast and discover the Pointe Géologie Archipelago, where we shall be living for a year. Our home will be the French Dumont d'Urville base, a short distance from the South Magnetic Pole. We shall be sharing the daily lives of around 30 scientists who spend winter here every year. The race against winter begins. The first harsh cold spells will soon close the pack ice around us. It's urgent to stock up on the supplies brought by the supply ship for the nine months of self-sufficiency. Any emission would be unforgivable since our isolation will be complete. On discovering the base, I feel I am finally being rewarded for the two feverish years spent preparing this slightly crazy project. This is Laurent. It's his first time on these high latitudes. I'm Jérôme. I'm moved to rediscover the atmosphere of these austral lands that I have visited before. We are here to film the Emperor Penguin's incredible struggle against the Antarctic winter. We've crossed two hemispheres to live with this extraordinary bird to spend a whole year at its side. On February 27th, the astrolab leaves just before the ice forms. Its stem seems to sever the last line still linking us to the outside world. It won't be back for nine months. The weather spreads winter over the ocean like a blanket. We are now alone, face to face with ourselves. Late March. We've been waiting three weeks already but the Emperor is taking its time. We are constantly questioning. When will it come? Which path will it choose? The only thing that we are sure of is that the Emperor Penguin returns to its realm every year at the end of March, and that we must be there at the right time because we are determined to shoot the footage of its arrival. 
base sur les palettes qui... On the morning of April 2nd, we leave the base to check on something that we can sense, but don't yet dare to believe. They're here. They have arrived. We hurry to meet the column. Laurent and I remember running that day like teenagers on their way to their first date. It's a magnificent, breathtaking sight. Overcome by emotion, we nonetheless have to work quickly and efficiently. I'm so moved that my hands are shaking and I end up having to let go of the camera tripod to keep the image steady. We are impressed by their determination and they need it to gauge the immensity of this continent by the simple measure of their tiny steps. They're so close to us. We thought they would be comical, but they are truly imperial. For the first time, we hear the sounds that will become our daily music. From time to time, some of them dive forward and toboggan a few yards on their bellies, helping themselves along with their short wings. Thousands of years now, the emperor penguins have left the open sea with the arrival of winter and walked more than 60 miles from the ocean to reach this place and mate near the archipelago's islands. A forced march focused on a single goal, ensuring the survival of their species. In this particular spot, they found a solid sea of ice and a relative protection from the storms. Havens of this kind are extremely rare, with only 40 or so for the whole of Antarctica. What an incredible day. The silence that we had grown used to on the base is replaced by the songs rising up from the colony. From today, things will no longer be the same since the emperor penguins will now be leading the dance and imposing their rhythm. Our days and nights will be organized according to them. From now on, our daily appointment with the penguins will become a ritual. Each morning, we get ready to go and visit them. Gestures that were clumsy just a few weeks before become automatic. 
Adventure is when extraordinary things start to become a routine. We acquire habits like that of putting on six layers of clothing at dawn, an undertaking that takes half an hour. Yes, Patrick, Laurent and I are heading out to the colony. Laurent and I are heading out to the colony. Do you copy? Today, for the first time, we are going to be working very close to the colony, just half a mile away. At this distance, the smell of the penguin is overpowering. This morning, the temperature is minus 20 degrees Celsius. The skin of our fingers sticks to the metal. Incredible. The penguins come over to us and surround us. So there are still creatures on this earth that aren't afraid of man. Their innocence delights us. There are 7,000 penguins here, all singing together. It's mid-April, the moment when the couples form. We are astounded by the paradox of these days. For even though time is short, the penguins devote almost two weeks to their mating dances, as if matters of the heart could not be rushed into. We know that the penguin's song informs its possible mates of its gender and his determination to pair off. The male announces himself with fairly detached cries. When a female is charmed by his song, she crosses the group, identifying herself with a more staccato song as she seeks out her suitor. This is the male's song. And the female's reply. Then the pack ice offers us the incredible sight of two creatures, intoxicated with each other, performing a dance of grace and tenderness, thus perpetuating the miracle of life in the icy wastes of Antarctica.
With its tender gestures, their acrobatic coupling is almost comical. Clouds massing on the horizon herald a change in the weather and remind us that in Antarctica it is impossible to make any long-term forecasts. The worst can happen at any second. The worst being the catabatic winds blowing from the South Pole like genuine avalanches, racing down the icy slopes, picking up snow as they go and reaching speeds of more than 125 miles per hour at times. We are confined to the base for a few days. Our thoughts are focused on the penguin colony. When we are shut in like this, time passes much more slowly. I sort through the hundreds of feet of sound recordings attempting to decode the apparent confusion. Laurent writes home and tries to find the words to describe the splendor of Antarctica. We must not forget, he writes, that the emperor has brought us to this icy realm to discover its features, labyrinths, and secret gardens. In the face of winter's architecture, in the face of this beauty decked out in pure and simple lines, in the face of the natural conjoining of crystals and light, cold and water, shadow and whiteness, we understand what the poet meant when he said, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy. The Emperor has given us a unique opportunity by releasing us for a year from the madness of the world, its noise and its fury, to seek refuge in a continent of peace and purity. May 5th, we weather another storm. Winds at 80 miles per hour, temperature of minus 30 degrees Celsius. Filming becomes very difficult. Each movement is a huge effort. What must the penguins be going through? A few new eggs have rolled over the ice where they have frozen almost instantaneously. And so, like a symbol of the harshness of the penguin's life, the first egg that we see is one that is already dead. Battered by the storm, we retreat, thinking of the damage that the hurricanes cause in the colony. As for the penguins, well, they have no choice. They have to lay their eggs in the middle of winter to make the most of the nine months of the year when the ice remains stable. The emperor penguin's life expectancy of 40 years makes up for the terrible conditions that it has to reproduce in.
When calm returns, we discover a sorry sight. During the season, one quarter of the eggs laid don't even hatch. The sun's return brings some good news. Through the camera viewfinder, Laurent frames an image of hope, an egg comfortably nested in a bare flap of skin, the emperor penguin's incubating pouch. Two weeks have passed since mating. We now observe a crucial moment. The female is about to pass her egg to the male, an extremely perilous undertaking. The precious burden has to pass from one pouch to the other while spending as little time as possible in contact with the ice that can freeze it in a few seconds. This year again, his dexterity saves the egg. As soon as she has passed the egg to the male, the female, exhausted from the laying, leaves for the ocean to feed. A 60-mile trek lies ahead of her. Once she reaches the sea, she will swim for thousands of miles to fish and stock up on food. As a final tribute to the females leaving the colony, we escort them for the first few miles. Without hesitation, they find the path of the northeast, choosing the quickest way to the open water in an attempt to win their race against time. This separation reminds us of our own circumstances. We too left our families and friends four months ago and have given ourselves up to the loneliness of Antarctica. Laurent and I soon wander off, gazing in wonder at the icy chaos around us. While following the females on the other side of an iceberg, we discover one of the most fascinating spots that we have come across during our stay. An ice cathedral whose towers, pillars, and naves stud the flat surface of the pack ice for the winter.
we meet a group of females that has appeared out of nowhere, and we thank them for leading us to this labyrinth of diamonds. Antarctica is a continent that invites its guests to seek wonder in detail. The perfect geometry of a crystal, the outline of a ridge, the veins and marbling of a bubble of ice, the angles and shadows drawn by the power of the frost are as much a delight as the sweeping views. The austral winter moves on. We are now at the end of May. The males enter the hardest part of the year. For them, the long wait is only just beginning. They are at the very entrance to the long tunnel of winter. A line of convicts imprisoned by the cold, hobbled by the most precious of loads. They move to a spot a few hundred yards from the former colony that is now soiled with droppings. We are curious about their movements on the ice, and so attach a camera to a weather balloon. Even in the land of penguins, helium makes a sound like ducks. Mid-June, the work continues tirelessly. The penguins' behavior has changed. Their sole enemy is the wintry cold, and they must band together to withstand it. The colony is no longer a group made up of individuals. It has become a living organism. The males organize a resistance movement and build a rampart with their bodies against the harsh temperatures. They press together, huddled up against each other. The outline of their melded bodies looks like the Roman legion's turtle. This ensures their survival. Life can be summed up in one word, resist. We 
We watch them form this compact block that retains heat at its core. In the middle of this natural incubator, the temperature can reach 15 degrees Celsius. We are fascinated by the penguins' resistance to these harsh conditions. We are so cold that we cannot spend more than three hours outside at a time. Penguins seem to dread an invisible danger. What threat could hover in this ghostly silence? Tu l'as senti sous tes pieds? You felt that under your feet? All of a sudden we understand. This is the period of the spring tides. The ocean is arching its back beneath the ice, and this activity raises the ice and causes it to groan. The empress perceived this movement long before it occurred. You ought to try this at 20 below. Set fire to the matches, make a small bundle of matches, and then the pack of matches will light the whole thing. Each day we follow the same ritual to make breakfast. With the cold, the simplest gestures become an ordeal. Eating becomes a chore. But how dare we complain about this food that we are never able to warm up while just behind us, 50 yards away, the males are beginning their third month without food. It's spicy. There's chili pepper in it, huh? It's to warm us up. <laughs> the day is increasingly shorter, force us to leave the colony a little earlier every evening. We reluctantly drag our polkas away, lingering in this landscape transformed by the polar night. Late June, the shortest days of the year. The sun, like the pendulum of a clock, slips down to the horizon and grazes it without ever lifting above it. <laughs> the winter solstice is marked by a huge fire lit on the ice. We celebrate midwinter with our friends from the Dumont d'Urville base, a welcome opportunity to forget the harshness of the austral latitudes. <laughs> the days are very short. The feeling of isolation heightens as the sun seems to abandon us. The wind, cold, the silence, our morale also enters a long winter night. We only have two and a half hours of light each day to steal a few shots in the fleeting brightness. Extreme cold, lost in the night, fasting for more than three months now, kept there by their duty, their fate hanging on their females' return. The males wait, watch, and resist, afforded no respite by the eggs that they are sitting on.
We were waiting for this day, like any other birth, as a delivery. In mid-July, the eggs hatch. We now hope that the females will return soon to feed their chicks. However, if they are delayed, the males, in spite of the four-month fast, amazingly manage to find a little regurgitated food for their chicks. But if the females arrive too late, they will abandon the chicks to go down to the sea to feed. This year again, greeted by a deafening concert, the females have returned, their stomachs heavy with several pounds of fish. And now the male leaves a chick with the female. It has to find the energy to leave its offspring to ensure its own survival. The female now has a task of feeding the chick and of teaching it, in song, the recognition codes. The liberated males head straight for the sea, straight for life. They have lost half their weight in the struggle against the cold. They weigh no more than 40 pounds now. They have to summon up all their remaining energy to cover 60 miles of pack ice. that the heartbreaking departure of the males coincides with the sun's return, which gives the ice its mantle of light again. The paradox of Antarctica, splendor and sadness, exist side by side. We have been on the Adelaide coast for six months now. Six months to get used to the howling of the wind followed by the staggering silence of the storm's aftermath. Six months to understand and share the heartbeat that governs the life of the emperor penguin colony. We're still waiting for snow. We feel at home here, and like ordinary householders, chatting about the snow and fine weather, deplore the drought. Usually there are eight to ten days of snow each month. Well, a day of snow can be one millimeter or three centimeters, but a big day of snow. Since early May, not one snowflake has fallen. Antarctica is a true desert that gets very little snowfall. Two or three millimeters at the most. Then the wind blows it off. It's totally swept away by the wind 48 hours later. As a joke, with the irony of the heavens, as soon as we complain about the scant snowfall, a blizzard strikes the archipelago. For the chicks, this storm is like an ordeal by fire. At the very beginning of their lives, these frail creatures are subject to merciless conditions.
September 2nd, we start to shoot that day in dangerous conditions. This catabatic wind blowing at 90 miles per hour lowers the temperature to minus 60 degrees. It could freeze our lungs and fingers in a matter of seconds. We protect ourselves as best we can. We have to beat a retreat. We have lingered too long, and the whiteout, the impenetrable and sudden mist of Antarctica, swallows us up. The horizon no longer exists. Neither does the ground, nor the sky, nor even what lies at the end of our outstretched arms. We are lost. We are just one kilometer from our base, but getting back there is a six-hour nightmare in this white hell. It will require the intervention of an emergency team sent out from the base and a full range of GPS technology to tear us from the clutches of this white death. A strange feeling after such a close brush with mortality. The doctor passes judgment. I have serious frostbite on my face and fingers of my right hand. Laurent only has superficial frostbite, but a fall has seriously damaged his knee. The result of this mishap, one month's rest. Here we are, shut in. We have to look after ourselves. Over these wasted hours, the river of our thoughts constantly flows back to the banks of the penguin colony. To ease his feelings of frustration, Laurent paces around like a caged animal, a way as good as any other of doing his physical therapy. When we are finally let back out, we fly over the ice like kids returning to their favorite playground. Three weeks of storms have done a lot of damage to the group. At first, our reunion is like a funeral. The chicks are now two months old. They spend most of their time in groups as if they were being raised in kindergartens. They are now emancipated and stroll around awaiting the return of their parents, who now make frequent return trips to the sea to bring back food. Some of them, probably orphans, beg to other mothers for food. The giant petrel suddenly comes back from the open sea with the return of the fine weather and settles near the colony. The petrel feeds on carrion, but the numerous carcasses lying around the ice are frozen, and so, to feed, it will take its daily requirements of living chicks.
Late October, the water dripping from fragile icicles announces the return of spring. The ice cracks and opens a short distance from the penguin colony. In these sections of open water, the Weddell Seal, a herald of better days, provides us with an opportunity to take a look at the underwater world. We discover the emperor penguin in its element. This fabulous swimmer can descend to a depth of 500 yards to fish and stay under for 20 minutes at a time. Having seen it waddle across the ice, we are astounded to see it move so smoothly through a world where we shall never be able to follow it. Early December, the Astrolab returns. We almost feel like crying out, already? We don't know whether to return to our loved ones in our world or to stay here where we have left a large part of ourselves. In the end, the emperor penguins decide for us by giving the departure signal. It has been like this for nine months now. They have always told us what we have to do. This is the last act in the penguins' epic journey. And we don't want to miss it, because it is the most beautiful. The young penguins are finally going to do what they were born to do. Something each and every one of us ends up doing. Taking the plunge. They are going to live in the sea for more than four years before returning to the colony and the scene of their birth. In casting off, we sever the bond linking us to the Adley coast and the Emperor Penguins archipelago. The icy land fades into the distance. We'll probably never see it again. In spite of the 13 months spent on the ice, we feel that we have only scratched the surface of Antarctica. The ship carries us back to a noisy world where time is measured differently than by the movement of the sun. Life has seemed all the more precious to us since the emperor penguins have shown us how fragile, delicate, and miraculous it is. We don't yet know how hard it will be to return and become ordinary citizens again, among other men, after all this time spent as the Emperor's subjects. <laughs>